All right, we're live. And we'll wait. It's Friday night. It's almost 7.30. Oh, just turned 7.30. So we're going to wait a couple minutes just to see who uh, decides to get on tonight and join us as uh, we travel through and journey through the Gospel of Luke. So we'll see. You could turn your Bible to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I hope you guys are ready. Luke chapter 1, for those of you who are online. We're going to hopefully, God willing, get through the rest of chapter 1. We're going to attempt to get through verses 57 all the way through 80. God bless you guys who are online. I love you guys. Uh, we'll get started in a minute. If you have a, your Bible with you and handy, turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 57 once we get started here in a couple minutes. Ferdinand, what's up my brother? I'm glad to see you. Love you. Hopefully you can make it out shortly, maybe next week. It'd be good to see you again, brother. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to attempt, as I've been saying, to get through chapter 1 today. So as I say that, I'll open my Bible. Lillian, how you doing? Good to see you again. God bless you. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be starting at verse 57, and we're going to see if we can make it through all the way to the end, verse 80. And we'll start here in another two minutes. I want to give uh, people a little time to get on, get situated, get comfortable, and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Is it hot? No, you're fine. You have a sweater on. You have a sweater on. I have a shirt, so I'm, I'm okay. All right. I'll just wait for it to get to 33, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Some good stuff here tonight. All right, 33. Let's go ahead and get started before we do. Um, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, ah, we're so thankful for all that you've done for us, Lord. And as we come before you now and, and sit at your feet and get into your word, Lord, we ask that you would just pour out your Holy Spirit upon this time, that you would bless it, that you would speak to our hearts, help us to understand these things that we're going to be going through in the Gospel of Luke tonight. And after we do, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may we live them out in our lives. So, Father, we ask that you would just be with us, that as we draw near to you, you would draw us nearer to yourself. Reveal yourself and speak to us tonight, we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone. Like I said, Luke chapter 1, we're going to pick up where we left off last week in verse 57. And we're going to attempt to make it through verse 80. So this will be, this is going to be a fun time in the Word of God tonight. But before we get started, I just wanted to encourage you guys, if the Lord speaks to you through this page and these teachings, and I do pray that we all would see Jesus and we would hear him tonight. And if that is the case for you, I encourage you to share it. I'm not sure what the like button does. I know it puts a blue thumbs up, um, but I'm more interested in sharing because it gets the gospel out to a lost and a dark world. There are so many, if you look around, there are so many people without Jesus Christ. 
and that is the remedy to the problems that we have in society today. So if this blesses you, I encourage you share the page to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to as many people as we can. With that being said, let's read chapter 1, verse 57. I'll read through verse 66 and we'll get into our study. So, verse 57, Dr. Luke writes, Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. But they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet, and they wrote, saying, His name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, praising God. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them, and all these sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. So, if you're familiar and you've been with us before, I like to go back and recap what we went through last week to refresh our memories and to bring us up to speed as we jump into verse 57 here so if you haven't been with us you'll understand what i'm going what i'm going to do right now as, as i bring an intro and i just go over some of the things that we went through last night so or last week sorry <laughs> so if you remember with me we talked about mary visiting elizabeth and in verse 39, it tells us that she arose with haste, which means she got up and went quickly. And she went to go visit Elizabeth. Now, that was some 80 to 100 miles, which is a long distance. A long, long distance in those days. Uh, I said it last week. Um, for us, this isn't that much. This is like a commute to and from work. Uh, on a daily basis for most of us, but for her, this is a long, long journey. So 80 to 100 miles. Possibly we talked about she went to Hebron or Hebron, which would have been a Levitical city. And we see that in Joshua 21, 11, if you remember with me. And then we see as we move along, as we moved along, we saw that she entered the home and that Elizabeth hears the greeting in verse 41. And then the Bible tells us that the, ba the baby left in her womb. And at that point, it says that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember in verse 15, earlier in chapter 1, it said that the baby would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So we are assuming that this is where this takes place. The fulfillment of what is said in verse 15 happens here in verse 41. And then in verse 42, we have a blessing from Elizabeth on Mary. And remember last week we talked about that this must have been comforting. The angel showed up and gave the birth announcement of Jesus Christ to Mary. And then he had said that behold, your relative Elizabeth is with child and she's in her sixth month. And then he goes on to say, for with God, nothing is impossible. And imagine how comforting it is knowing that she's going to see Elizabeth, but also to Zacharias, the priest. And a priest would have been the one to give the official condemnation to have her stoned. So I can only imagine what's in her mind as she's making the journey. First, full of joy and excitement. And then knowing Elizabeth is pregnant and she's 80 plus years old. And the angel 
came and spoke to Zacharias and knowing she'd be able to relate a little bit to what Mary has gone through. But at the same time, there might have been a little hesitation because he is a priest and he would have been the one to bring the official condemnation. So you can imagine the comfort that she finds when Elizabeth blesses her. And then we saw something interesting in verse 43. And she says, but why is this granted to me? And I'm not going to belabor this a little any more, any more than, than I should, but I'm always in amazement of what he has done for me. And I'm sure in the room here, if we just think about what God has done for us, we will be amazed. And for those of us online, think about what God has done for you. How truly amazing God is. And it will fill your heart with praise and wonder. And you'll be left in awe of who God is. And like I said last week, if the only thing he did for me was the cross, that would be enough. I'm in amazement when I think and I meditate on what he did at the cross for me. Because I know who I am inside. I know that I'm a wretch. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I'm sure all of us online here and all of us here, we could say the same thing. And she says, why is this granted to me? And then we see in 44, it said that the baby leapt or leaped in the womb for joy. So, John the Baptist, or like I called him last week, John B., he's leaping in the womb in the presence of the Lord. Now, Mary's conceived. She's not very far along at this point. And you see the joy in the presence of the Lord. And it's interesting because my son Samuel, he's, he's quite a character. <laughs> And he's, over the last month or so, he's learned to jump. And when he does, he always smiles. And you can see the joy fill up in his face. And he's barely getting off the ground. Maybe an inch if he's lucky. But it's such a great accomplish accomplishment to him. And it always makes me smile. And I was looking at him the other day and watching him jump and get excited when I walked into the room. And he'll start jumping and dancing and and I couldn't help but think of this. That John leaped for joy in the womb. The very presence of Christ. And I talked about it last week. How is it going to be when we actually see him face to face? Am I going to be like my little baby Samuel who's one? Am I going to be jumping up and looking and smiling at Jesus and jumping and, and turning and dancing and or am I going to fall on my face in worship and in awe? Am I going to run and give him a big hug and say thank you? And thank you, are, it, it's two words and it, does, it just doesn't seem to do justice. It doesn't say completely what's in our hearts. But will I do that? I don't know. But I, I can tell you it's going to be a great day. The first time I close, when I close my eyes here and I open my eyes for the first time and I see my Lord and Savior... It will be a great, great moment. And then moving on, she says, blessed is she who believed. And we are blessed also. Remember in John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. He goes on to say, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's all of us. And I spoke on this last week. That's all of us. And then I wanted you, I want you to notice, it says there will be a fulfillment in verse 45 of those, thing, of those things which were told her from the Lord. What the Lord has said will come to pass. 
He can be trusted. He is not a man that he should lie. The Bible tells us in Numbers 23. He does not lie. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word can be trusted. Although everything else will pass away, the grass may wither, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will endure forever. That is something that you should know without a shadow of a doubt. God can be trusted. He is trustworthy. Remember, he is faithful even when we are faithless. He cannot deny himself. Always remember these things. These are important things to remember. And then we got into what is called the Magnificat. In verse 46 and 45, we see Mary's song of praise to the Lord. I'm just going to run over a few things here. Um, like I said, it's the Magnificat. Right there it says in 46, my soul magnifies the Lord in the Latin. That's where we get Magnificat. So you might hear that sometimes. And remember that in these 10 verses last week, I told you that we see Mary quote 23 Old Testament passages. And remember, I told you she's really young. She's 14 or 15, maybe 16 years old. Whatever the case is, she's young and she knows her word. She knows the word of God and you see it because her 10 verses, her songs of praise are it's littered with the Old Testament. So that tells me she has a working knowledge of the scripture. And so should we. So should we. I think a lot of times we make a lot of excuses why we can't remember things. And it's just so hard to remember the word of God. It's but we have in our minds, and people have heard me say that, I say it quite often, we have a lot of Jeopardy knowledge in our mind locked away. Just random, useless information just rolling around in our brains. And yet we can't remember the Word of God? And we can't take the time to do that? We can, and as I look at Mary... And you see what she wrote and how she sang this. And you see the different references to the Old Testament littered within these 10 verses. And to know she's young and she has an intimate knowledge of the Word of God. That should be all of us as believers. I can't think of any excuse. I really can't. And this goes out to me too, guys. This isn't just somebody speaking saying, hey, you got to do this and do that. No, this is for all of us. We need to have a working knowledge of the scripture. There is no excuse for us. We take the time all the time to sit down and watch, you know, dumb things on TV or, or get on our phones. And before you know it, an hour and a half has gone by. Wasted. Redeem the time. Redeem the time. And there's always a quote I love from Charles Spurgeon. Remember, when you kill time... It has no resurrection. So redeem the time. Now we've seen in 47. This is, this is pretty powerful stuff here. She says, God, my Savior. So she recognizes her need for a Savior. She was, like us, a sinner saved by grace and she was blessed but nowhere in scripture can you find where she is made to be more than human that is something that is important to remember because she says it right here she sings out that her spirit has rejoiced in god my savior so she recognizes her need of grace. And then we saw that she said, and this is something as you read through it, you can put yourself and you can sing this same song. For he who is mighty has done great things for me in verse 49. Psalm 71, 19 says, Also your righteousness, O God, is very high. 
you who have done great things. O oh God, who is like you? Psalm 126.3, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. And we are glad. Aren't you glad? Because God has done great things for you. Aren't you glad? Because of the cross? Hasn't it filled your heart with gladness, joy, praise, wonder, awe, love? And we saw in 51, it says he has shown strength with his arm. And I said last week, this signifies the power of the Lord. And then in 53, 1 of Isaiah, he asked a question, to whom has the Lord, the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then when you read through that, you'll see him reveal to you and to all of us, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And God has shown the strength of his arm and revealed his power and love in the salvation he has given to us. And we're going to get there, Luke 3, 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And then in 53, we talked about this at length. I wanted to refresh your memory on this one specifically. Filled the hungry. And we talked about it last week. People don't generally recognize their need, their lost condition. Um, so they continue to fill their th themselves with the things of the world. And because of their wealth, and we see this, and because of their contentment in the things of the world, they turn away from the eternal riches that are found in Christ and continue on in their sins. Because we don't generally see the need. We don't see our lost condition. Proverbs eleven twenty eight says this, He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage. Luke 18, 24, and when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And we talked about this, to trust in the Lord and not in the world or the things of the world. And notice it says he has filled the hungry with good things. We all have hungry. Or we all have hungry. We, we all have hunger. The key is, what is filling that hunger? What is it? And you can sit now and think within yourself what it is. Is it Jesus or is it the world? My brothers and my sisters, you're hungry, you're hungry. There we go again. Uh, I might be hungry right now. That's why it's coming up. <laughs> oh, man. But your hunger needs to be filled by Jesus Christ, not the world. Not the world. And sad to say, the church is not being filled with Christ. In a lot of places, the church, and I don't want to say every place, but the church, in a lot of sense, senses, is being filled by the world. And we're seeing that people are being deceived. We're getting away from the Word of God. We are getting away from Jesus Christ. And it's something that all of us have as believers need to remember we have a hunger and we fill it with Jesus Christ and his word. I encourage all of you to get into his word, to communicate with God through prayer and open the word of God and watch how he'll speak to you. And then she talked about Israel And she says, in remembrance of his mercy, and God remembers his oath, she sees herself right in, in line of the fulfillment of this through the seed. And I wonder if she's thought about this, 
thought about everything that's going on and remembered what Isaiah wrote in chapter 7, verse 14, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and think, oh, that's me. Imagine thinking that. I'm that virgin. That's me. And then it says that she remained until Elizabeth is nine months pregnant. Now moving into verse 57 and 58, it says, Now Elizabeth full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So we see John the Baptist's birth. So this is interesting. In the house, you're going to have a Jew and a Baptist. I wonder how that worked. <laughs> oh, man. So she brought forth a son. And this promise was fulfilled just as God said it would be. And remember earlier I had said you can trust God. And when he says something, it will come to pass. And we see that here. God always keeps his promises. Then it says in 58, they rejoiced with her. The neighbors and the relatives. And this fulfills the promise that we see in verse 14 of Luke chapter 1. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. So the custom at this time was when the time of the birth was near at hand. Friends and local musicians gathered near the house. So picture this in your mind. They're gathering there's a bunch of people, there's friends, there's family, there's musicians. They're gathered near the house. And when the birth was announced, and it was announced it was a boy, the musicians broke into song. And there was universal congratulation and rejoicing. So imagine that scene. But if it was a girl... The music, musicians went silently and regretfully away. And there was a saying that said the birth of a son brought universal joy, but the birth of a daughter brought universal sorrow. So we see here that she had double joy because she had a child, one, and he was a male. Now, ladies... Jesus Christ has elevated womanhood to its proper place, its proper beautiful place. And it wasn't like that until the teachings of Christ. He has elevated you to where you belong, but it was not like that. So, and then in 59, it says, so it was, on the eighth day that they came to circumcise a child and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. And in verse 60, his mother answered and said, no, he shall be called John 61. But they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So the eighth day in 59, it was customary for Jews to give names to children at the time of their circumcision. Now the rabbis say that this was because, because God changed the name of Abram and Sarai, at the same time, he instituted circumcision in Genesis 17. And then in Genesis 21, 3 through 4, we see Abraham names Isaac on the eighth day. And Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore to him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Luke 2, 21, and we'll get there. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Then it goes on to say, they would have called him. Notice she says, no, in verse 60. He shall be called John. Both Zacharias and Elizabeth knew the name of the child had to be John, according to the command from the angel that we saw in verse 13 of Luke chapter 1. Then it says, No one among your relatives who was called by this name. The custom was to name a child after a relative, but he had no relative named John, so they're wondering what's going on here. And in 62, 
It says, so they made signs to his father, what he would have them call. This makes me think of when Zacharias came out of the temple to give the blessing to the people after the burning of the incense. And it, the Bible says he, he beckoned to them because <laughs> he could not speak. So now we have something similar going on. It says they made signs to his father, what he would have him called. And some say this is because he was deaf, but we're not sure of that. In verse 20, it says he won't be able to speak. It does not say he was deaf. Um, it could be that he was. He may, he, maybe he was deaf, but maybe he wasn't. We're not sure. Um, but it's interesting because they made signs. So maybe it was Zacharias wrote on a tablet and said, just tell them I can't hear. So they stop asking me all these questions. Who knows? Who knows? I'm just saying. And then it says a writing tablet. I just wanted to tell you because I thought this was interesting. It's a wood plank. So you guys get a picture of what the, the tablet looked like in those days. It's not like an iPad or, or the one by uh, the Galaxy. What is it called? The Galaxy, uh, the tablet by Galaxy. We'll just say that. And the iPad, he didn't have that. So what they had was a wood plank that was layered with a thin layer of wax. And then they had like a gold pen or a stylus or silver or bronze with a sharp end on one end so he could write. On the other end, it was flat, it was pushed. That way he could turn it around and kind of smooth it out so he could use it again. So that's the tablet that, that he's using. I thought that was interesting. And in verse 63, it says his name is John. Notice it does not say, I think his name should be John. His name is John. And this is Zacharias writing this on the tablet. He responded in faith. Not like the first time that we saw in verse 18 when he says, how shall I know this? And immediately in verse 64, it says his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he spoke praising God this fulfills what Gabriel said in verse 20 you won't be able to speak until these things take place and notice he praised God he did not curse God some of us after nine months and you have to picture this for a second he goes from having full function in his mouth of being able to use his tongue and his throat and everything that goes along with that to use and to make sounds and, and make words. And he's in his 80s, remember. So he's had 80 plus years of being able to speak and for the last nine months can say nothing. A lot of us would have got upset at God. And I'm not sure how many of us, when our mouth was opened, praise would come out. Unbelief closed his mouth in verse 18. And now we see here, faith opened it. And he didn't grow bitter over the nine months, which is something that I encourage you guys to hold on. If there's anyone watching now and you're in the valley and you're in the middle of a trial and it looks like to you that there's no end in sight, what's going on? Is this gonna last forever? Hold on. And whatever God is working out, it will be for your good. It will be for his good. And don't grow bitter, grow better. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Count it all joy. 
going to produce patience. It says in James, it's that Greek word hupomone, which means to remain under a heavy weight. It's getting you ready for the next one. Remember, in this world, you shall have tribulation, Jesus said. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Hold on. Jesus Christ will get you through the storm. He will take you to the other side. Do not lose hope. Do not give up. Hold on. Cling tighter. Lean on him. Trust in him. He is always there. He will never leave nor forsake you. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them. That's a reverential awe. And this happens when God moves in somebody's life. And then it says, this report spread throughout all the hill country of Judea. So think of somebody that God has moved in their life and you've seen him move. And you're like, what? And you're going out and telling him, did you see what he did? This guy or this lady used to be X, Y, and Z, and now they're over here praising God. They're telling me about God. That will spread. When God moves and does a wondrous work, people look and glorify God, and it spreads. Maybe it was you when you got saved. You went and told your family. Now they're reacting like, what the heck? And it spreads throughout the whole family, and everybody starts talking about it. It's not always good. But they're talking about it. And then it says, kept them in their hearts saying, what kind of child will this be? And as, is, as we've seen, there have been so many extraordinary things up to this point in his conception and birth. So surely God has designed him for some extraordinary purpose. And people are talking about it. These things they laid up in their heart patiently waiting to see what God would work. And then it says the hand of the Lord was with him. So God was with him. Basically, it shows the guidance or the providence of God. And then let's read 67 through 79. Now we're making good time. Now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring, that's pretty cool, from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And then it says at 80, so the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. So now we have what is called Zacharias prophecy or Zacharias song. Um, it does, it's also called the Benedictus. And we'll see that, I think, in verse 68 there. It's called that because of the Latin. That's how it's translated in the Latin. You might have heard this song, and it's called the Benedictus. But now we get into the song of Zacharias. And as you read this, you have to remember, they, the Jews, were oppressed by the Romans at this time. They were under Roman occupation. So they were looking... For the Messiah to come and to deliver them out of this. And prophecy, as I said, this is Zechariah's prophecy. 
It's not only, prophecy is not only to be able to tell about future events. But it's also to give the mind of God in relation to the present or the future. And if you notice the first part as we go through this, the first part of this speaks of Jesus Christ. The last part, when it says, and you child in, in 76, that's referencing John the Baptist. Or, as we've been calling him, John B. So notice in verse 67, it says, Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now this is what the world needs now. People filled with the Holy Spirit. A church that's filled with the Holy Spirit. It's by His Spirit that we move forward. And the church is famishing for the lack of the Holy Spirit. Because the church has seemingly forgot that fact. It's by the Holy Spirit that we move forth in His power, in His strength, and for His glory. This is what the world needs now. It needs people filled with the Holy Spirit. Then it says, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel in verse 68. So he's blessing God because he says he has visited his people. John 1:14 says, and the world became and the world and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's John 1:14. So you see, this is prophecy. This is speaking forward in future events because Christ has not yet been born. And then it says he visited his people. And then he redeemed his people. That's the purpose of his visit, redemption. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So we see redemption is the purpose of the coming of Christ. Verse 69, it says, He raised up a horn of salvation for us. The horn is symbolic of power. Psalm 18, 2, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So, you could say, Oh, blessed be God. He has visited his people. God has come to bring redemption, to give power for salvation through the house of his servant, David. And in 70, he says, as he spoke by the mouth of his prophets who have been since the world began. This, the Messiah, and we see it, he's all throughout the Old Testament. He's spoken of by David and and Isaiah, and he has spoken of in many other places all throughout the Old Testament. And then it says something interesting. It says, since the world began, and if you go all the way back to the garden, we see in Genesis 3.15, it says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. That's prophecy concerning the Messiah and his defeat of Satan. All the way back in the garden. This prophecy also gives the first hint of the virgin birth, if you look at it. Declaring the Messiah, the deliverer, would be the seed of the woman, but not of the man. Notice it says, and her seed. Then he goes on. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of those 
of all who hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Remember, we've been talking about this. God remembers his oath. Zacharias means God remembers. Elizabeth, his oath. Together, God remembers his oath. Genesis twenty two eighteen, God speaking to Abraham, he says, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And in 74 and 75, it says, To grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies, here we go, guys, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Now, this is interesting, so pay attention, you guys. This is important here. Now, both holiness, and we see here it says, in holiness and righteousness, and righteousness have as their root idea here that of being right. Well, holiness is a rightness of character, whereas righteousness is a rightness in conduct. The one springs out of the other. Holiness is the root. Righteousness is the fruit that springs forth from that root. And so many today are trying to be right without holiness. And it will fail without it. And it will fail miserably. You've got to be pure at the core. You've got to have that holiness, right attitude to have Right actions. And remember with me the Pharisees. They had a system of righteousness without holiness. And if you remember, it failed. And it failed miserably. Now let's see what Jesus has to say. Matthew 5.20 For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So for the disciples to hear this and for people around to hear that statement, they would be looking at each other like, did he just say that? What did he say? Oh, yeah, I thought, I thought that's what he said, but... Who's more righteous than the Pharisees? That would have been a big deal. And Jesus is saying they're not going to make it. They weren't going to make it. Why? Because they had righteousness without holiness. It wasn't from the heart. And how do you make your heart right? This comes from having a real relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how you make your heart right. That's the only way we might serve him, as it says, without fear and in holiness and righteousness is through Jesus Christ. And it's a verse that you guys are pretty familiar with. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's because of Christ that we can stand in righteousness and we can live holy lives and in turn produce the righteousness. It's only because we are in Christ. Christ has done it all. We just stand in Christ. Victorious in Christ. Blessed in Christ. Always remember that. And as we move here into a conclusion, we're going to roll to a conclusion here in 76 through 80. We actually made it, guys. Praise God. <laughs> now we're going to see, remember I said earlier that the first part, and you're going to see a little bit of Jesus here, but in 76 through 79, closing out his song, 
he's now going to say, and you, child, which is John the Baptist, or John B. And then it says he's going to be the prophet of the highest. Luke 7, 28 says, For I say to you, and this is Jesus speaking, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And in 77, it says to give knowledge of salvation to his people. And then in verse 17, we've seen what? That he will make ready a people ready for the Lord. And in Luke 3, 3, we see that he preached a baptism of repentance. So he's going to teach and he's going to give knowledge of salvation. And John 1, 29 says, The next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 78 and 79 through the tender mercy of our God. This is this is cool. This when we first read this, I said, Oh, that's cool. This is cool to me. With which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So, day spring, this is like a sunrise. And this is a beautiful picture. And picture it in your mind. Picture it for a second. It's a beautiful picture of the sun breaking through and we've all seen those glorious pictures that people take or professional photographers have taken of the sun creeping up over the horizon and how it just lights up everything and the darkness is removed and, and we see it all the time the different colors uh, the sun the light reflecting off of everything and how it's just removing the darkness it's so beautiful to see the sunrise and this is a picture it's a beautiful picture right here when it says the day spring from on high has visited us. I want you guys to see this. It's a beautiful picture of the sun breaking through the darkness. And as we move into verse 79 and lighting our pathway to peace, peace with God. Peace with God. And you may be watching right now and if you've stuck around long enough, you may not have peace with God. You may be at war with God because you've refused to repent, to recognize your need for a savior, to see that he died for you. That's how much he loves you, that he got up on a cross and he shed his blood and he died a horrible death and paid a debt he did not owe because you owed a debt you cannot pay. You can have peace with God. All you have to do is say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me in your blood. And he will. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loves you tremendously. So much so that he sent his only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you. Know that now if you are watching online. Jesus Christ, the purpose of his visit was to redeem you from the bondage of your sin, to break the chain. He loves you. He hung on a tree for you, for me, and for all of us. But God demonstrates his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's an awesome love. And he loves you. And if you're listening now. And you don't have peace with God in your warring. You can. Receive the Lord and the free gift of eternal life. That he has provided for you. By shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary. 
And then we'll, we're going to close this out, guys, in verse 80. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Now this is interesting because we don't have much about what happened. And remember, I want you guys to remember his parents were really old. He might have been an orphan at a young age. I don't think they're in the Guinness Book of World Records for living long. I, they didn't live to 900, so nine something like the guys in the Old Testament. So <laughs> there's no way, but he must have been an orphan at a young age. And the hand of God was with him providing. And it's like that old Chuckism, right? That we've heard. And if, you, if you're not familiar with Chuck Smith, he had a lot of sayings. But, and they're called, a lot of them now are called Chuckisms. He said, where God guides, God provides. God guided him to the desert. God provided. His hand was upon him. He looked out for him. He protected him. But we don't have much. But I wonder what that was like. Because his parents probably passed away when he was young. When he was young, they were already in their 80s. They were old already. And it says he grew and became strong in spirit. And I want you guys to see this. And was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation till is in to until his day of his of his manifestation to Israel. He was in the deserts. And I want you guys just to know this, because some of us may be in a valley. We're going through a tough time. The desert is oftentimes the training ground for those who are called to to serve God greatly. And if you want to go deep with God, you will go through deep things. You will go through great things, great trials. You will go into the furnace of affliction and you will become like the gold and silver in the refining pot. And when it's heated, all the dross comes to the top and God removes it. And what's left is pure. He will take out what is not good, but it comes through fire, through affliction, through trial. And it's the desert, oftentimes, that becomes the training ground. His best soldiers come out of the desert. And if that's you, hold on. I could go into a long thing and I'm not. Hold on. Like I said earlier, grow better, not bitter. God loves you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Cling tight. Hold on. God said I'll get you through to the other side. Trust him. We just learned and we're seeing that he can be trusted. That his word never fails. His promises will always ring true. And he loves you. And he will be with you every step of the way. Hold fast. Lean on him. And at the end of the day, you'll look back. And you'll see the hand of God in your life guiding you. Shaping and molding you. As the, as the potter. Who shapes and molds the clay? Just hold on. You are his masterpiece, his workmanship, his poema, says in Ephesians. And he will be there and he will get you through. So hold tight. Let's pray. Father, wow, Lord, we're in awe of all that you do in our lives. We're so thankful for the cross that makes all this possible now. We're in awe of how much you love us. Of all the great things you've done in our lives, Father. And Lord, we just lift up those 
who are online now who may be in the middle of a very hard circumstance. Maybe they're sick, Lord, or maybe you're dealing with the loss of a loved one. Maybe you're having hardship at work. Maybe you have a prodigal child. Maybe just, it could be anything, Lord. We lift it to you now and ask, Father, that you would just reach down, touch and bring healing where needed. We ask that you would bring comfort and peace, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit. You would meet them, Lord, exactly where they're at. Meet the need, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would give them the strength to push forward, to keep fighting the good fight, to keep running the race. Impress upon their hearts now how much you love them and that you are there with them every step of the way, Lord. We lift it to you. And Father, maybe there's some, maybe there's some on watching now or who may be watching later that have not experienced peace with you, Father. Maybe you're online now and you don't have peace with God. You can. The Holy Spirit would be saying to you, now come. Saying, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me, Lord, in your blood. I am a sinner. I promise to follow you the rest of my days to the best of my ability, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give you my life. And if you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Savior, the Bible now says your life, your your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you can do that now. Wherever you're at, you maybe you're driving, maybe you're just at home on a laptop, maybe you're working out and listening on your phone. Just know. Jesus Christ loves you. He proved it on the cross when he died for your sin. And Father, continue to work in us. May these things, as we continue to travel through your word in the Gospel of Luke, may these things just pierce our hearts. I pray, Father, that you would empower us, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit to, to be able to walk in love, and in your power. May you use us in such a way where the world around us that's so dark sees you and hears you, Father. May our lives speak you. May they see you. Use us, we ask, Lord, in a mighty, mighty way. And Father, go before us the rest of this week. Be with us. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, I love you. God bless. And I always say it, and I'll say it again. If you have any prayer requests, please put it in, a, in the comment section. Anybody in the group can see it. They would love to pray for you. I would love to pray for you. Let's come together as one. Lift our prayers in one accord to the throne of grace, knowing that he hears us. I love you guys, and if you've been blessed by this, please share the page. Like I said earlier, let's come together in one accord and get the gospel of Jesus Christ out to everybody in the whole world. I love you guys. God bless. I'll see you next week.